I appreciate you sharing some of your time with me this evening. My name is Benham Tarani. I'm an interventional cardiologist here at Inova Heart and Vascular Institute. Um, and I'll be spending some time uh, talking to you about uh, managing heart disease uh, risk factors. So uh, I'm going to start off with a case. And this is you know, a patient that you know, I've seen in my practice. And those of you who have um, loved ones or know people that have had heart issues, this may uh, you know, uh, provide some uh, familiarity with for you. Uh, this is a 48-year-old man who had a history of cholesterol and had a family history of heart disease uh, that came to my practice about a year ago. Actually, I take care of his father. And his father had recommended that he come and see me because he was having some exertional chest pain. He's a physically active person. Uh, he uh, jogs uh, about a mile a day, uh, at least five times a week, and he otherwise has a busy work. Um, but he says that, you know, I just noticed that when I get into my, you know, 80th, um, 80th percentile of my exercise capacity, I just don't have the same exertional capacity that I had in the past. I get chest discomfort. I, I feel a little shorter breath, and I have to stop, and it goes away. And maybe because you know I'm turning 50 years old in a couple of years, and maybe age. Um, but you know he had an, he had an exercise treadmill stress test three months ago, as these symptoms were starting to accelerate, and it was unremarkable. As I mentioned, his father, at the age of 45, had bypass surgery. So uh, given that he had a quote-unquote normal exercise stress test. I said, you know, well, let me just send you for a coronary CAT scan to kind of get a better idea of what your heart looks like. And as you can see here, this is a three-dimensional view of the heart. Um, and uh, just to kind of give you some fam familiarity with what we're looking at, this artery coming down is your left anterior descending artery, the main artery coming down the side of the heart. And this artery kind of wrapping around in a groove-like fashion in the back wall of the heart is called a circumflex. What our radiologist noted where the arrows are was that there was some uh, narrowing, what we call stenosis there. And so when they broke that down into the CAT scan view, looking at it not three-dimensionally, they described a high-grade narrowing in this artery. And so clearly this gentleman's having symptoms. He has a blockage in one of his main arteries. And so what I did was I called him that evening. I said, sir, I think we should recommend going ahead and doing a formal angiogram because you may need an angioplasty and a stent given your symptoms. So he came in um, that, at the end of that week uh, and we did his coronary angiogram, and this is a procedure which is catheter-based through a two-millimeter puncture in the radial artery. Took a catheter up into the heart, and this is his right coronary artery, the artery that feeds the front and the bottom portion of the heart on the right side. It had only you know, a mild amount of disease and blockage. And this is the artery that, uh, uh, that was of question on the CT scan. And as you can see here, I don't know, is my arrow working on the... Um, as you can see here, in, in the mid portion up there, there is, a, there is a narrowing where there's a lot of branching in that same artery called the LAD. And that clearly was uh, new. It's, it's been going on for s several weeks. And so we felt that was clearly the culprit for his uh, symptoms. And so uh, within you know, a matter of minutes, we were able to treat this by putting a wire down the artery, doing a balloon angioplasty, and doing a final stenting procedure. And as you can see, blood flow got better. Uh, he went home that afternoon as a same-day discharge and back to regular baseline levels of physical activity, and he has not had any more of those symptoms in the year since uh, we took care of him. So this is somebody that's you know, part of the community. He's had a very busy job. He, he has an executive position. He's very physically active. He knows he has a family history. He's been taking good care of himself, but clearly genetics at some point caught up to him, and fortunate you know, he did not have a heart attack. He was taken care of rather quickly. So heart disease is a big deal. In the year 2019, as we sit here together in this room as we talk about it, it's the leading cause of mortality around the world, not just in this country, but around the world. More than 17 million deaths per year. In the year 2016, it was almost 800, 850,000 total deaths in the US. So one out of every three was due to heart disease. And it claims more lives in all forms of cancer, uh, respiratory illnesses, and anything else outside the heart. And in the year 2014 to 2015, as you can see here, uh, you know, heart disease uh, you know, has a cost. You know, over $200 billion of total productivity and over $137 billion of indirect productivity uh, and lost time. So these patients, uh, they're, they're affected by disease of their heart. You know, they have to spend time either in the hospital or, or the time that it requires to see their physicians and receive the around-the-clock care that they need. 
Now, within heart disease, coronary heart disease, which we'll talk about today due to blockages called atherosclerosis or plaque buildup in the heart arteries, this accounts for almost half of all of that. And again, more than high blood pressure, more than stroke, more than heart failure. And we say that you know, it's the, uh, about 600,000 um, heart attacks per year happen. Number one cause of death in the United States, again, this is within heart disease, uh, we say that one out of every 40 seconds, somebody has symptoms of a heart attack. So someone's going to have chest pain, shortness of breath, they may have nausea, they may have arm heaviness. And typically, women develop heart, uh, their first heart event later than men, about six to seven years later. Men at the age of 66, women typically at the age of 72. And plaque, which is what uh, this is all about, is if, is if you look at this microscopic view, so the arteries tunnel down the front of the heart or the back of the heart on the muscle, and these take these uh, arteries that are two, between two and five millimeters, and you start cutting them like a hose, looking at them in cross-section, it's because plaque starts to happen at a very young age, as, as early as adolescent years. You know, they've been shown from autopsy studies in Vietnam and Gulf War that young men in their late teens or in their early 20s, they can start to develop plaque. Some of it may be genetic, some of it may be uh, smoking or other bad habits, early onset of diabetes. But plaque starts to happen at a young age, and what causes the heart attack, as you'll see here in the second uh, little um, uh, circle here is when that plaque ruptures, it becomes unstable, clot starts to attach to it, and this area where blood has to flow through it and the white becomes occluded, and then that can either heal, which is what happens most of the time, or it can close and the person will develop symptoms of a heart attack, and they come in and we open this up with a balloon and a stent, and they do very well. And the concept of plaque formation over the last several decades has evolved. You know, initially it was thought that you know, this may be a process because blood flow is slowing down, but now we've realized that not only is it a combination of plaque and cholesterol buildup, it's a combination of inflammation, the body's immune response is a very complex pathway. So a lot of these medicines that we prescribe in addition to aspirin and whatnot, like cholesterol medicines, blood pressure medicines, is to keep the lining of the artery healthy, to reduce inflammation, reduce the formation of plaque that can heal and then become more concentric and organized, and to prevent what we ultimately work, we, we care about the most is, um, is a heart event. And so, you know, we've, we've, we, we were initially really focused on secondary prevention, meaning that the event happens, the person will hopefully recover from it, and then what do we do to prevent it from happening again? And, you know, I, Dwight D. Eisenhower had his first heart attack in 1955, and for the remainder of his life, even after that, he developed congestive heart failure and all the, all the complications. And we know a lot of other people that we hear about in the news that this happens to. Unfortunately, afterwards, it becomes a proposition of secondary prevention. But now, as we've learned more about how bad smoking is, about how important it is to control diabetes and blood pressure, we've become very good at focusing on primary prevention, preventing somebody that may have risk factors or have no risk factors from developing those risk factors that can then uh, predispose that person to developing, a, um, to developing a heart event. And so, as we think about the levels of prevention, we can think about primordial prevention, so meaning as early as childhood and, and uh, teenage years, to really focus on exercise, focus on good sleep, focus on good habits around what we eat, uh, you know, not being exposed to secondhand smoke, all those good things. And then as we get older into our 30s and in our 40s, if we start to develop risk factors like uh, cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes, what we call metabolic syndrome, which is the conglomerate of all of these together, you know, treating those risk factors appropriately so that we're not in the secondary prevention phase when somebody has, God forbid, developed a stroke, they have severe congestive heart failure, and they start to develop a lot of debilitating conditions that affect their quality of life. And so the purpose of my talk today is to kind of go over these risk factors, how to manage one's risk factors. And, you know, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association put out this really nice little graphic here uh, with their new guidelines, and it talks about the ABCs of managing heart disease risk factors. And we'll go over all of these with you today. Um, aspirin, and I'll save that for the end because there's been a lot of data coming around aspirin and what its role in primary prevention is. And please, I, know I ask that you take away from this talk is we're talking about primary prevention for aspirin, not secondary prevention, someone that's already had a stent or bypass surgery or stroke. The benefit of aspirin has been proven there. We're talking about primary prevention. We'll talk about blood pressure, cholesterol, cigarettes, diet, diet diabetes, and then, and then a little bit about exercise. 
So the first recommendation by the American College of Cardiology is that management of heart disease or management of, of a patient in, in a primary preventative fashion should really be a team-based approach. The physician should really work with the patient and along with any other healthcare providers that may be involved in the care of that patient. Uh, endocrinologist if you're diabetes, if you have diabetes, kidney doctor if you have kidney disease, and to develop a shared decision-making model so that we really understand where each patient comes from and we provide them the best care possible. Social determinants are really play a role in, in people's health. You know, the environment that they're raised in, what they may be exposed to, these things are very important. And so it becomes, it becomes critically important that as physicians we all work together uh, with the patient and their loved ones to really address all of those social determinants. So what are social determinants? Stressors in life, the depression, uh, sleep hygiene. Um, how aware is the patient of what's going on with their health? Some p patients are very attuned, in tune, they know what's going on, they know their medications, like the back of their hand, they know their blood tests, their cholesterol, their diabetes, but there are some that may not know that, and so we have to help provide those patients the education that's needed. There are other things that play, into role, play, in, uh, play a role, body size perception. So eating, the, eating disorders is also another component to think about. Social and cultural inf influences. In certain cultures, uh, you know, certain things are looked upon and certain things are looked down upon. Uh, you know, does the person live in a stable home? Does the person have transportation that they can get them to work and gets them to see their physicians? Uh, do they have access to, to uh, institutions where they can go and get physical exercise and do the things that they need? Simple as a YMCA. And the, the most important thing, and we have to be very sensitive to it, is are they safe? Are they exposed to any uh, violence around them that may, pre that may prevent that? It's very simple. It's very easy to cast judgment upon somebody if we don't know where they come from and, and, what, and what potential barriers may exist in their life. And so what we want to do as physicians is we want to address all of that. We want to understand where each patient comes from and then follow the guidelines and offer the patients what, we, what they need. But what we don't want to do is to fall into this theory of therapeutic inertia is, okay, we've figured out you have blood pressure, we've figured out you have diabetes, these are your medicines, and it kind of goes into cruise control, and then we don't really um, uh, adjust the medications to what the goal should be, where somebody's now, their diabetes was a diagnosed, they were started on medicines, but they're really not at their goal. The cholesterol is not at their goal, their weight is not at their goal. So it's not only important to identify the patient's social background and their determinants and to treat the risk factors, but to be really aggressive, work with the patient individually to offer them the best quality of life. So assessing risk is very important. Now why is risk so important? As I'll show you in a slide, we have data now going back several decades that the more risk factors somebody has for heart disease, the higher the risk for, for developing an event. And so the American College of Cardiology put out this really elegant um, risk assess calculator and it's on your iPhone, you can go to the website, it's called ACC Risk Assess and it will tell you literally what that person's risk for heart disease is. It looks at age, it looks at their gender, it looks at their race, their blood pressure, their cholesterol, are they diabetic? Are they a smoker? Are they on a cholesterol medicine? And it gives you the risk. And we'll go over all of these risk numbers with you, but that's one of the simplest ways as a, a physician taking care of a patient that you're seeing for the first time to kind of get an overall assessment of where they fall in the overall risk assessment uh, for heart disease. And this data is now almost uh, eight years old. Uh, this was a meta-analysis, which is taking a number of studies and putting them together, over 200,000 patients, and it showed that when uh, patients had multiple risk factors, so blood pressure is not controlled well, cholesterol is not controlled, they're, they're smoking or they're diabetic, the more the risk, the higher the, uh, the, the higher the risk for an event. So for a man who has optimal risk factor control, you know, they, they have about a 3.5% chance over the course of their lifetime for developing a heart event. But look at it when it's not ideally controlled, 10 times that. For a woman, 18 times that. So it becomes really important to control these risk factors optimally. And then there's risk factors and then there are risk enhancing factors. So factors that don't fall into the classic ones that we think about like diabetes or high blood pressure or cholesterol, but things like family history. Um, you know, are they, do they have metabolic syndrome? I, I mentioned that earlier. That's the conglomeration of not only your blood sugar, your cholesterol, but also your weight, but also your weight and your waist size. So for, uh, you know, for a man, we typically say if your waist size is over 102 centimeters, for a woman over 88 centimeters, you fall in that, well, um, you fall in that um, metabolic syndrome uh, profile. You have chronic kidney disease. Patients with kidney disease are at higher risk for heart disease. Early progression of atherosclerosis and calcium and plaque buildup, and they are at higher risk. 
Do they have some sort of inflammatory condition, so lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, even HIV? HIV by itself, and as well as the medications treated, uh, used to treat HIV, they can sometimes promote or accelerate atherosclerosis. Um, other things, you know, inflammatory markers, C-reactive protein, we'll talk about these, but also peripheral arterial disease. If someone has narrowing or blockages in their leg arteries or in their carotid arteries or in their abdominal aorta, like an aneurysm even, they are clearly at higher risk for coronary artery disease. And so that's the risk assessment. Now let's kind of go through each of these. Blood pressure. So, you know, the blood pressure guidelines changed. Uh, Still, we, we, you know, we recommend for a blood pressure of less than 120 over 80, but if your blood pressure is not between 120 to 130, you're no longer called prehypertension. You actually are, 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 are classified as uh, elevated blood pressure. Higher than uh, one that, between 130 to 139, high blood pressure. And then, uh, that's stage one, so any, anything above 130 uh, is considered stage one. Over 140 is considered stage two. And that's a uh, significant change from what it was in the previous decade where it was over 140 being considered a stage one blood pressure. And this is you know, data that's been collected and this is a lot of information that we're learning and some say, well, we're being more aggressive and perhaps promoting medication use. But as I'll show you, we have some data that suggests that the more aggressive we are with lowering blood pressure, uh, the, the more we're able to reduce the risk for heart disease. And each 20 millimeter increment rise in the top blood pressure numbers, the systolic number, or 10 in the bottom number, two times the increased risk for a fatal heart event. So blood pressure is really important. This trial, um, which was published almost four, uh, four years ago now, called the SPRINT trial, it randomized almost uh, over 9,000 patients with a blood pressure over 130, and they were at increased risk. Some risk factors except diabetes, and they were then randomized to either aggressive blood pressure control less than 120 or more of a lenient control less than 140. And what they saw was when you look at the primary outcomes of heart attack, stroke, heart failure, there was a significant reduction uh, in the intensive treatment arm, which was about 1.6% right, per year of, of, of an event versus 2.2% in the more lenient arm. So we have data that suggests that being more aggressive with blood pressure, especially if you have diabetes, if you have cholesterol, if you have a family history, even people that ha may have a peripheral vascular disease like an aortic aneurysm, strict blood pressure control is critically important. And so when treating blood pressure, it becomes really important to kind of bring all three factors together. So clearly, um, you know, we look at the environment. So we say cut back on what you're eating in terms of salt. Cut back on your portions. Uh, you know, uh, really uh, uh, increase protein in your diet, but cut back on, on uh, salt and, uh, and carbohydrates. But also, it's also that there's a genetic component. We know that blood pressure certainly has a genetic component to it. And obviously, the social determinants that we talked about as well. Does the patient have access where they can get healthy food? Uh, is a, uh, uh, does the patient really understand the difference between low salt and high salt? It's very easy to go to the grocery market and buy something, but without looking at the back or the label, it becomes difficult to understand, really, is what I'm buying here healthy for me? Is, 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 is this right for me? And so when treating blood pressure, really the backbone is always, you know, first looking at non-pharmacologic or non-medication approaches. So, you know, looking at ways to, re to reduce the blood pressure by a heart-healthy lifestyle. So we know that, you know, just by weight loss, as simple as, you know, losing, you know, one kilogram can translate into one a number one millimeter drop on top of the blood pressure. So someone that undergoes good weight loss, if they have high blood pressure, we can bring that top number down by five millimeters. Healthy diet, so we think about uh, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, fish, chicken, that can bring your blood pressure down significantly by 11 millimeters of mercury on the top number if you have high blood pressure. Reducing your salt intake, so you know, you know, typically we think about you know, one and a half grams a day, but ideally less than one gram a day, less than two teaspoons. You can bring that number down by five millimeters. And then increasing your intake of potassium, so th bananas, nuts, those things that are more of a healthier intake, that can reduce your blood pressure by four to five millimeters of mercury. Physical activity, so simple physical activity as going to, the, as going to your local YMCA and walking on the track, uh, doing some time on the treadmill, as you can see those can bring your numbers down between four to eight millimeters. And there's some data that suggests that moderate consumption of alcohol, uh, as a man, you know, we typically say, you know, you know, uh, up to you know one one and a half drinks a day. As a woman, a, a little bit less than that. That because of antioxidant and other properties of it. So like red wine, that can also reduce your uh, blood pressure as well. And so, 
As you'll see here, the top uh, bar there shows previous classification system. So before, one, less than 120 over 80, normal, same as it is now. But if you were between 120 to 140, you fell in the pre-hypertension range. But as I showed you now, if you're between 120 to 130, you're in the elevated, and if you're really above 130, you're classified as having high, hypertension or high blood pressure. And obviously over 140 now, you're considered as stage two, whereas before it was over 160. And so really the focus should be if you don't have high blood pressure, but there's a family history or there's a predisposition, to focus on, on the healthy lifestyle habits. But if you do have high blood pressure, obviously make sure to include the non-pharmacologic healthy lifestyle habits that I talked about earlier. And then, based on their 10-year uh, risk of heart disease, then to determine you know, whether a blood pressure medication um, regimen is needed. And really, once you initiate therapy, the goal should be less than 130 um, over 80. So that's blood pressure, not cholesterol. As I mentioned, cholesterol or plaque buildup happens at a young age. And we have data uh, from uh, autopsies, as I mentioned, from the Gulf War and Vietnam War that suggests that, suggest that plaque buildup based on yellow fatty streaks happens in the arteries of the, of the, uh, um, of the heart at a very young age. It's an inflammatory process. Uh, LDL, which is, the, uh, which is the main fatty particle, is undertaken into the wall of the vessel. It gets eaten up by scavenger white blood cells, and then you start to form this yellow fatty streak within the artery. And as you can see here, subclinical atherosclerosis, meaning that there's plaque, but it hasn't manifested itself in the form of chest pain, shortness of breath, heart disease, or heart failure can happen at an early age. And that's where you really need to focus on primary prevention. So healthy eating, uh, exercise, uh, not smoking, uh, controlling diabetes if you have that. And ultimately, unfortunately, if that plaque starts to build up over a long, longer period of time, that, uh, that plaque can rupture, uh, 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 platelets plug up that hole, and then a person can develop uh, you know, uh, a cardiovascular event, and then we're in a secondary prevention uh, proposition. And we have data that suggests that the higher the LDL, the LDL is your bad cholesterol, that's what causes the yellow fatty streaks, the higher the LDL at a, at, a, at a very young age and the higher that LDL is over a consecutive period of time, the increase the risk for um, a heart event at a young age, even, at the, even at less than the age of 40. And so that's where a cholesterol control becomes critically important. And so as we assess someone's risk for heart disease and we assess um, their, uh, their, overall bio, uh, their overall biological profile for developing heart disease, you know, we focus on what I described earlier was this uh, risk assessment tool that the American College of Cardiology has put out. Now again, this is primary prevention. We're not talking secondary prevention, primary prevention. And what we say is, you know, between less than the age of 20, it really it's important to focus on, uh, you know, making sure that, you know, children and adolescents are eating healthy. They eat three times a day. They have an adequate intake of fruits and vegetables. Um, and then if there's a family history for heart disease, then they should be checked for that. Is there some familial component of hyperlipidemia? And that exists where, where they have LDL levels really high and sometimes in excess of 200. And that becomes a decision working with their pediatrician or their general internist to determine whether statin therapy should be initiated at a younger age. But again, in the majority of times, it's around healthy lifestyle uh, and diet. Between the ages of 20 to 40, it becomes important to start kind of getting an idea of what that risk is. And if their LDL is significantly high, you know, the, the guidelines say over 160 and there's a significant family history, consideration should be given for a statin if uh, the uh, uh, non-pharmacologic methods that I talked about earlier have not been undertaken. And then really, it's between the ages of 40 to 75 that it becomes really important to focus on optimizing, um, uh, in terms of um, optimizing risk factors. So if somebody um, is has a cholesterol, so if they're uh, 40 to 75 and they're diabetic, consideration should be given to starting them an at least moderate intensity statin therapy. Diabetes by itself is a coronary artery disease risk equivalent. Diabetes promotes earlier plaque buildup in the heart arteries, calcification, cholesterol buildup, and so uh, consideration should be given for that. Now, if uh, at the age of 40 to 75, uh, you know, it really becomes important if they're not diabetic, to then go through the risk assessed calculator that I talked to you about to kind of get an idea of where they are. If their risk comes out to being less than 5%, they fall into low risk. And the low risk category there talks about um, lifestyle modification measures, diet, exercise, all these things that I've been saying repetitive, re repetitively. Between 5 and 7.5%, 
borderline risk. And so at the borderline risk, you know, to, to determine whether somebody should be initiated on statin therapy for reducing cholesterol, and statins are like Lipitor, Crestor, drugs that you, many of you probably heard about, uh, you know, it becomes important to look at, okay, are there other risk-enhancing factors? So uh, is there some inflammatory condition? Are they, do they have kidney disease? Uh, and, and then to help make a decision. And we'll talk about it in a bit. Once you're in this borderline or intermediate zone, this is where a, a calcium score becomes important. And that, that may be, that's a question that you may have. And then if you're intermediate, so we talk about low risk, we talk about borderline risk, intermediate risk between 7.5 to 20%, then, then it falls into this area where we have to really think about uh, initiating statin therapy if, it, if, if that's favored, or if the person's kind of on the fence and they're not really sure what they want to do, getting a coronary calcium score. So a CT scan to assess the burden of calcium in the heart arteries. This is not the same kind of calcium that we have in the milk or yogurt or dietary calcium that we consume, but calcium that develops over time because of plaque. Calcium is a surrogate marker in the heart arteries of plaque and cholesterol. And we'll talk about it in a bit, but typically if your calcium score is zero, that means you have no plaque or no calcium buildup, so you not necessarily don't have to initiate statin therapy then. If it's between one and 100, you know, typically favor statin therapy, especially if you're over the age of 55. And if, it's, and if it's over 100, then it really says that you have underlying atherosclerosis or heart disease, even if you're not symptomatic. And, you know, that would favor starting statin therapy. And if you're high risk, more than 20%, then statin therapy should be initiated because of its anti-inflammatory effects, the, the ability to reduce cholesterol, and the ability to reduce the risk for heart disease. So low risk, borderline risk, intermediate risk, and then high risk. And so when we think about the different kinds of cholesterol drugs that are available, we think about high intensity. So we, th we think about Lipitor, really at a really high dose, 40 to 80 milligrams. We think about Crestor, which is 20 to 40 milligrams. So the way I, I, the way I learned it in school was that the higher intensity drugs are always four times stronger than the, the medium and, 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 and the lower intensity ones below it. So 20 to 40 of Crestor, 40 to 80 of Lipitor, Moderate intensity, as you can see here, it gets cut in by, by four. So 10 to 20 of Lipitor, 5 to 10 of Crestor. Um, we think about Zocor, which is Simvastatin. Some of you may be on that. Pravastatin, like Pravacol. Lovastatin, like Mevacor, which is one of the, the initial cholesterol, the drugs that came out in the in 1980s. Uh, Pitavastatin, which is Lavalo, and then even lower, dose, even lower intensity, lower doses of those drugs and even drugs like Lescol, like Fluvastatin, which many people don't, t don't take anymore because it's not very potent. And so we've assessed the risk. If you're low risk, it's focusing on uh, diet and lifestyle modification measures. High risk, we're going to focus on cholesterol medications. And if you fall into the in borderline or intermediate risk, this is where you know, doing a coronary calcium score can become handy. So as I mentioned, if it's between 1 and 100 or really over 100, the data suggests that you know, a patient should be on statin therapy, especially if they're over the age of 55. And the coronary calcium score is literally a CAT scan that assesses the amount of calcium and plaque buildup that happens in these arteries. And so who is this appropriate for? Patients that are falling into that intermediate risk, patients that are really reluctant to initiate statin therapy but need some sort of um, adjudicator to show them that indeed they have some underlying plaque buildup. Older patients uh, that, have, that have a low burden of risk factors but you know, are not sure whether they will benefit from statin therapy. And, you know, then, uh, and then otherwise, as I mentioned, the people that are in the borderline or in the intermediate risk. Now we have statins, which have been around for a long time, and the data has been very strong in terms of their benefit. But we have newer drugs that are also available now. Some of you may be on or some of you may, may know people that take them, called PCSK9 inhibitors. These are injectable drugs that are given under the skin every two weeks. So the ones that are available are, are Rapatha and, and Praluent. You probably have seen these in the commercials. And these are basically monoclonal antibodies that prevent the breakdown of LDL receptors. So the, the, the liver cells put up receptors so they can eat up, L, uh, so they can L, eat up LDL. What you want to do is you don't want those receptors to break down because then you have more LDL circulating in the blood. These drugs prevent the breakdown of those receptors by, uh, by targeting what's called PCSK9. Uh, which, is a, uh, which is a protein which is available. Uh, and these drugs have been shown to significantly reduce uh, the risk for heart, uh, uh, um, heart, uh, heart events. We, we had a number of trials that came out over the, next, over the last two years. The four-year trial 
uh, which looked at um, evolocumab and then the Odyssey trial. And these drugs showed that when you took patients that were already on a statin and they were on a good dose of a statin and they were not meeting their target goal, uh, the, the addition of a PCSK9 inhibitor significantly improved it. So when I think about somebody that would benefit from these drugs, I think about a patient that's already had a heart event, that has uh, already taken maximum dose of a Crestor medicine and cannot bring their cholesterol down, is even sometimes taking Zetia, and then, therefore this becomes a substitute. Or patients that have had a heart event are responding appropriately to these high dose statin, but they can't tolerate it because of side effects like muscle aches and pains. And these drugs uh, obviate, that, uh, obviate that. So we talked about blood pressure, we talked about cholesterol, cigarettes. I mean, anybody, everybody in this room knows how bad cigarette smoking is. You know, we have, we have data going back to over 55 years ago from the Surgeon General's office. Uh, that's, that sh for first showed that cigarette smoking is significantly um, has significant adverse effects on on, uh, on one's health. It's the leading preventable cause of uh, of death around the world, meaning that it's it, it is a reversible risk factor, simple as putting a cigarette down and not smoking. Six million deaths annually, almost half a million uh, die in this country from smoking or secondhand exposure. And smoking actually you know, reduces one's life expectancy. So not only is it heart disease, but lung cancer, uh, kidney disease, uh, it, it plays a role. And we know about 15% of U U.S. adults uh, smoke, up to 8% of high schoolers, uh, and you know, a little over 2% of middle school students. So despite all the good work that we've done in, in raising awareness and preventing people from um, smoking, that, you know, it's, still, it's still prevalent in our society. And as you can see here from the early 1900s, from World War I, and then, when, and then when the Great Depression happened, and then World War II, there was a, there was a significant peak. And you know, many of you, if you look at the old pictures from the White House, back in the, you know, the 50s and the 60s, you know, when they had state dinners and people came by, they, they actually had, they, they would give them cigarettes. And it was a badge of honor at those times for someone to smoke. And then with the first report by the Surgeon General showing the adverse effects of uh, smoking on one's health, and, subsequent, um, uh, and then subsequent efforts that were made with other reports and then, and then the federal tax on smoking and just overall education. We can see here there's been a significant decline, but it's still a prevalent part uh, of our society. How does smoking um, you know, put, put one at risk for heart disease? So uh, we know that there's nicotine and then there's the carcinogens that are with the nicotine uh, when one smokes. So not only does it put in, uh, increased oxygen demand on the heart, it can promote atherosclerosis uh, in the heart arteries, it can really uh, affect our cholesterol synthesis and our cholesterol levels. And also, you know, over time with other risk factors, we are at risk for heart rhythm issues. So it's truly a, it's tr it's truly a, um, it's truly a carcinogen. It puts significant risk on, on one's body. Uh, now, when we think about um, the continuum of safe nicotine use, and we're hearing a lot about vaping now, um, but, you know, we think about, obviously, combustible tobacco, cigarettes, cigars, pipes, hookahs. Those are the worst. Those have lots of carcinogens. Uh, with the nicotine, and, and they put one at high risk for heart disease. Then we think about the more simple kinds, just nicotine, but without the carcinogens with it. So a patch, a gum, uh, you know, those are uh, sometimes even a spray. Uh, those are the safest kinds. And then we kind of fall in that intermediate zone with uh, vaping, um, with uh, oral tobacco, and as we know, that puts one at risk for oral cancer, esophageal cancer, uh, aside just from heart disease. But really, you know, the focus should be on identifying the patient that smokes, you know, identifying the reason why they're smoking, looking at some of the social determinants, and offering them uh, ways at healthy uh, forms of alternative nicotine supplementation. So, you know, as I, as I mentioned here, it really becomes important. These are the guidelines from the American College of Cardiology that all adults should be assessed at every healthcare visit for smoking uh, and finding out why they're smoking. It uh, becomes important to offer them the behavioral interventions. Um, you know, offering them alternative forms of healthy nicotine supplementation and really trying to avoid not only primary smoking uh, but secondhand exposure. So patch, gum, lozenges, and even other pharmacologic therapies like Wellbutrin, which is a psychotropic medicine but can help reduce one's craving, and things like Chantix. 
Diabetes. So we talked about blood pressure, cholesterol, cigarettes, now diabetes. Many of you in this room may, know, uh, uh, may either have had diabetes or have it or know, know people in your family or around you that may have diabetes. This is truly a metabolic disorder. It can happen uh, at a very young age when you know, children are born with, born with type 1 diabetes, usually an autoimmune condition. But over time, the most common kind is type 2 diabetes, a metabolic condition because of resistance to insulin. Typically identified uh, by a, you know, a certain uh, blood sugar fasting levels, but one way to kind of get an idea of what one's blood sugar status is, is checking their hemoglobin A1C. That's, uh, uh, that's a measure of what your blood sugars are over the course of three months. Between 5.7 and 6.4%, you fall into what's called impaired glucose tolerance, IGT, or borderline diabetes. Over the 6.5, that's, that's frank diabetes. And the development and progression of diabetes is heavily influenced by diet and all the other um, lifestyle factors that play a role. About 1 in 10 uh, of, of uh, U.S. adults are diabetic, and 80 million, this is a country of you know, over 300 million but you know, about a quarter of U.S. adults may fall into the borderline diabetic range, the pre-diabetic. And so diabetes itself also has, um, uh, uh, as, as I mentioned, diabetes is a cardiovascular disease risk equivalent, but within diabetes, certain conditions that may develop are, can serve as risk-enhancing factors for heart disease. So if you have a long duration of diabetes, if, if it starts to spill into your kidney, meaning uh, that it, it's affecting your kidneys, so you start to lose protein or albumin in your urine, uh, eye disease, retinopathy, uh, neuropathy uh, from, from um, a neurovascular disease from diabetes, and obviously we know that diabetes can also cause peripheral vascular disease, plaque buildup and cholesterol in the leg arteries. And so really focusing on treating diabetes should be uh, first and foremost on dietary counseling, on making sure that the, the person understands what's important in their diet to reduce their risk, focusing on exercise, you know, about 150 minutes per week. And then if you're not able to get your hemoglobin A1C down to a goal of less than 7, as I mentioned, over 6.5 is considered diabetes, then initiating pharmacologic therapies. Now, we'll talk about this. There's a lot happening now in the field of what's now called diabetology. Uh, you know, metformin, which some of you may have taken or you may have known people that do take it, has been a drug that's been available for a long time. It helps to increase the body's sensitivity to insulin so you can lower blood sugar levels. And that's always been the first line drug, but now we have newer drugs available. SGL2, sodium glucose uh, transport inhibitors that basically uh, prevent the reabsorption of uh, salt and, and, and blood sugar in the urine, in the kidneys, and results in the excretion of that. Those drugs have been, there's been an explosion of data that suggests that they can help to reduce the risk for heart disease. And those are drugs like Invokana, Farsiga, Jardians, which you may have heard of. And we have other drugs available called GLP-1 agonists, glucose, glucagon-like peptide agonists. Those are ones that help work on the brain's ability to control one's appetite, but they also increase the amount of insulin. These two new classes of drugs, there will be an explosion of data over the next five to ten years in terms of their benefit for reducing the risk for heart disease. And even for people that have heart disease, for, for um, developing the adverse endpoints associated with diabetes. This trial was just shown at the European Society of Cardiology uh, within the last month and a half called DAPA-HF. It was looking at this one particular drug that was uh, of an SGL2 called adapoglyphosin, and it looked at people that have heart failure. You know, we, we look at something called the ejection fraction, the fraction of blood in the heart that gets pumped out to the rest of the body. Norm, normally is above 50%, but less than 50 is considered um, some, some level of heart failure, subclinical or clinical. They looked at less than 40, and people that had some clinical evidence of heart failure, shortness of breath with moderate exertion, shortness of breath with mild exertion, or shortness of breath at rest, and when they compared that drug versus placebo in addition to standard of care. So not substituting, but in addition to standard of care, they saw significant reductions in worsening heart failure or death, significant reductions in heart failure hospitalizations, significant reductions in cardiovascular disease and death from any cause. So there will be more to come. There is a push by the American College of Cardiology that cardiologists should help take on some of this role for treating diabetes. For a long time, it was the role of the primary care doctor and the role of the endocrinologist to do this. But we know that diabetes and, and now cardiovascular disease are hand in hand, and there's so much data now with regard to these newer drugs that are coming out and their favorable effects on reducing ad adverse endpoints on heart failure and heart disease. And so there will be a push forward, and there will be a certain subsegment of cardiologists that will be 
diabetologist that will treat uh, diabetes. So uh, cholesterol management in diabetes, as I mentioned, if you're between 40 to 75 and you have diabetes, it's really important to initiate statin therapy early. And people that are diabetic and have multiple risk factors, it's appropriate uh, to initiate high-intensity statins to really reduce your LDL numbers by less than 50%. So really the goal LDL for somebody with diabetes is less than 70. Diet. So we think about the Western diet, we think about McDonald's, we think about Wendy's, you know, all the good comfort foods that are available to us. But we know the suboptimal diet is responsible for about 20% of premature deaths globally. And in fact, almost 40% of U.S. adults, this is by the American Heart Association, have some form of suboptimal diet. And we think about processed meats, high salt in their diet, we think about uh, sugary beverages, so diet sodas, sodas. Those are things that we think about, whereas more, more healthy things like uh, fruits, vegetables, uh, the Mediterranean diet, whole grain, you know, those are the things that have been shown in data to help reduce the risk for heart disease. And so, again, as I go back to my point, you know, we're talking about primary prevention here, but really primary prevention starts at the level of primordial prevention uh, in, in adolescent and teenage years. The focus should be on, on undertaking those healthy um, uh, the healthy aspects of our diet, the healthy aspects of our lifestyle. And as then we enter our 30s and our 40s, and then we're in the primary prevention phase where we're trying to either prevent risk factors or take risk factors and minimize their risk for heart disease, then really focusing things on um, you know, uh, bringing all that under control. And diet is, is a critically important part. You know, you can, you can be taking your blood pressure medicines, your diabetes medicines, but if you're going out every night and having a, you know, having a burger and fries, you're not really doing yourself any good. And so and, and that's ultimately critically important because then once you're in the secondary prevention phase, unfortunately that person will lose a significant uh, aspect of their quality of life. And so obesity, which kind of falls uh, into this after uh, diet, is really defined as a body mass index more than 30. The prevalence of obesity in this country is almost 40%. And the prevalence of class 3 obesity, meaning a body mass index of more than 40, so morbidly obese, is over 7%. And that's associated with a significant cost on our, uh, on our healthcare dollars. It's associated with, with reduced work productivity. Typically, it's defined obesity as a waist size more than 120 centimeters in men and more than 94 centimeters in women. And, uh, and by a waist to hip ratio of more than 0.9 in men and more than 0.85 in women. Obesity is a big deal. Obesity is one of the reasons why people develop diabetes. Because when they, have, they develop in, insulin resistance, the body does not, is not able to acclimate to the amount of uh, sugar that's, that's there. And this is an inflammatory process that kind of propagates itself. And people can then develop high blood pressure, and then they develop a heart, a heart disease and ultimately heart failure. And so this is a nice little schematic diagram which talks about Okay, you have, a, you have an obese person. Well, what's, what's wrong with that? They just have more tissue. They're maybe, you know, they, it's, you know, they just stay warm during the wintertime, right? It's, well, it's not as simple as that. Increased amount of blood puts increased amount of pressure on the heart. Over time, that causes the heart to get enlarged, both the left side and the right side. And then that can then predispose one to developing metabolic syndrome, metabolic disorders, and ultimately developing um, heart disease. And so it's important to prevent obesity, and that starts with diet first. A diet that's rich in vegetables, fruits, nuts, whole grains. Uh, it's important to reduce the amount of monounsaturated uh, and the amount of polyunsaturated fats, so like oils and margarines and things that we think about. Uh, and to really identify the person that if they've really exhausted all of that, but they still have moderate risk for heart disease and, or if they're diabetic, that they be initiated on statin therapy. And it's really important to reduce trans fatty acids. Physical activity, so we talked about diet, now physical activity. Uh, more than seven hours of our day in, the, in, in North America is considered being sedentary. So we're sitting behind our desk, uh, you know, we're answering all these emails, we're on our iPhone, we have a very impatient executive who wants, who wants something done by the end of the day. We're very busy, we're very busy creatures, so we have a, a lot to do, but seven hours of being sedentary is, is not good for us. We need to increase our level of physical activity. So either moderate or some uh, vigorous levels of physical activity. And that period of sedentary activity doesn't even include sleep. So if you sleep six to eight hours and you add seven hours of sedentary activity, that's 12, that's 50% of the day you're not doing anything. So it's important to remain active. So sedentary behavior, sitting, reclining, watching television, being on your iPhone. We think about light activity, so you know, just walking slowly, cooking, 
maybe you know, uh, cleaning up the house, that's still light activity. It's not moderate or, or a vigorous. Moderate activity, we think about biking, yoga, ballroom dancing. That's a great level of physical activity for those of you who like that. Recreational swimming. And then, there's, and then there's vigorous activity, so jogging, running, biking, playing tennis, playing basketball, doing some sort of physical activity where you're you know, really doing aerobic exercise. And so the benefits of exercise are significant. First and foremost, it's good for your mind. You ask anybody, and, and I'm sure all of you here that have exercised know this, when, when you're done, you feel, like you're, you feel like your body's lighter, you feel like your mind is at, at ease, uh, you, you feel like you have less stress on you, and there's been some data that helps reduce the amount of depression. It also increases your, uh, it gets your heart tone up, uh, it, it actually lowers your baseline heart rate, and it's got good tone, uh, good, uh, good effects on heart rate um, tone. It also, uh, you know, reduces cholesterol, it reduces, you know, this, um, the stickiness of platelets, the, or those cells that causes the arteries to harden up. It also uh, lowers your cholesterol, so it raises your good cholesterol, it lowers your bad cholesterol, it lowers your blood pressure, reduces the amount of fat uh, that, that, we, that we have around our waist, and also hemodynamically. It just gets our body going the way we need it to be. We, our heart becomes smart. We generate more cardiac output. It reduces the amount of oxygen demand on the heart. It just has a lot of positive effects across the entire spectrum of the human organism's body. So again, the recommendations are typically 150 minutes per week of moderate activity or 75 minutes per week of vigorous activity. So I will tell a patient, go to, the, go to the gym five times a week for 30 minutes on the treadmill. Then you've met your requirements to help get you to where you want to be. And so maintain, just maintaining a, a, a heart healthy lifestyle is what I mentioned, 150 minutes per week of moderate activity, preventing further weight gain even more than that. Uh, you know, promoting significant weight loss even more than that. You know, that could be, you know, an hour a day, seven times a week. And obviously then, you know, once the person has lost weight and they're in that really maintenance phase, then we typically say, you know, five to six hours a week. Sleep. Sleep is very important. I mean, that's, I think many of you around this room will, would agree with me that, you know, good sleep, uh, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's a good quantity of restful sleep is very important. There's data that suggests, and we have this data from Spain, we have it from UK, uh, that, you know, lower amounts of sleep uh, it puts one at, typically defines less than six hours of sleep, puts one at risk for heart disease. Six to eight hours, you're kind of where you want to be, and above eight hours, significantly higher than that, that, that also has its own adverse, uh, adverse effects on the body. But this is data that came from Spain. We have data from the UK as well as in this country that shows good quality sleep for six to eight hours a day significantly reduces the risk for plaque buildup in the peripheral vessels in the body compared to uh, very low amounts of sleep. Alcohol. Alcohol at moderate consumption levels can help reduce the risk for heart disease. So typically one to two drinks a day for a man of you know, red wine or moderate, al moderate intensity alcohol, one drink a day for a woman can help reduce your levels of HDL, can help reduce your levels of um, fibrinogen, which is those inflammatory um, cell markers. It helps to also uh, um, really increase the levels of good healthy cholesterol that stimulates good uh, cholesterol breakdown. There's data that suggests that there is a U-shaped phenomenon, that once you, you're, you're in that moderate intensity zone, so one to two drinks a day for a man, one drink a day for a woman, then you really reduce your risk for heart disease. But once you're significantly above that, or if you have no alcohol consumption, your risk is higher than if you were having moderate consumption. Aspirin, um, you know, and again, this is the last part of the talk, and then we'll, you know, we'll open this up to some uh, discussions. Aspirin is a question that, that's raised uh, very frequently is, is there a benefit to aspirin? So the benefits for aspirin in secondary prevention, I meaning you've already had a heart event, you have a stent, you had a stroke, some, some, sort of a, a, some sort of a vascular event, that's been proven. We're not, we're not here to argue about secondary prevention of asp with aspirin use, but primary prevention. Aspirin has been used, and the data comes back from, the, you know, from willow bark with uh, salicylate from the ancient Sumerians in the Middle East and the ancient Egyptians. It's, it's effective, as we know, for fever. It's effective for reducing pain and inflammation. And it was in the late 1800s where this German chemist, Dr. Hoffman, uh, took the acetyl group and then combined it with salicylic acid, so we got acetylsalicylic acid, which is what aspirin is. And the data has been very good with it with secondary prevention. 30 years, 34 years of data from the FDA suggests 
that primary prevention, uh, secondary prevention with aspirin 81 milligrams uh, has significant health effects. In fact, if you have a stent in your heart, we recommend bringing on aspirin indefinitely because there's a risk that that stent can close, can, that, that, uh, that clot can form. But it's around primary prevention where we just don't, uh, where the data now for a long time has been mixed, but it's moving towards uh, not advocating the use of aspirin primarily in primary prevention. And that's despite the fact that 36 million adults in the United States have no heart disease or have no heart disease risk factors are taking aspirin. From either self-reassurance or they've been told by somebody it's, it's good to take it, but the data suggests that that's not, uh, that's not the case. So I'm showing you here about 31 years worth of data. This is data from uh, all over the world, including Japan. Uh, where the green is that there's a positive effectiveness for aspirin, red is neutral uh, or, you know, or slightly negative, and then the white is, is, uh, is inconclusive. In the year 2018, we got three big trials. These are trials in the United States, in Australia, as well as in Europe, which suggested as a whole that uh, the benefits may not be there. In fact, there may be an increased risk for bleeding. The ARRIVE trial, this was, a, 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 this was a study which looked at patients with moderate heart disease risk. So, uh, and it looked at endpoints of uh, death from heart disease, uh, heart attack, unstable angina from chest pain or stroke. Um, and it showed that there was no difference between aspirin or placebo. A, uh, then there was the ASCEND trial that looked at people that were diabetic. So I told you, if you're diabetic, you should be on a statin drug. But we should also be on an aspirin. This trial suggested that there is possibly a benefit for being on aspirin in terms of reducing the risk for heart disease, uh, heart attack, or a stroke. A SPREE trial was people that were over the age of 75. So we're looking at people that are moderate risk, diabetes, and elderly. All the people that in the back of our mind we think about as being higher risk for heart disease. And that showed that there was no difference between aspirin and placebo when looking at heart death, heart, heart attack, stroke, or heart failure. All of them, these same trials now, when they looked at bleeding, they showed that there was a significant higher risk of bleeding with aspirin compared to nothing. So now, as we think about these three trials, so I'm trying to keep it very simple. So ARRIVE looked at moderate risk patients, typically heart disease risk over you know, 10 to 20%. ASEN was diabetics. ESPRI was older patients. The, the risk for a major adverse cardiovascular event with aspirin versus a, a you know, sugar pill, in, as a whole, it, with the exception of ASEN, was kind of flat, but bleeding was significantly higher. And so now as a consequence of this, there was another study that came out just this year in the Journal of American College of Cardiology, which did a meta-analysis, meaning it took not just one or two studies, but a number of studies. And this looked at over 160,000 patients in 15 trials, and it showed that compared to sugar pill alone, placebo, aspirin was associated with similar all-cause death, cardiac vascular death, and non-cardiovascular death. So at this point now, the recommendations in 2019 by the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology is if you're over the age of 70 and from, for a purely primary preventative phase, it's, it's recommending against aspirin. And even if you're between 40 to 70, it's a weak recommendation. So truly, if, you're, if you don't have heart disease, you don't have any heart events, but you have risk factors and you're not sure whether you want to be on aspirin or whether you should take it, talk with your cardiologist or talk with your primary care doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. If you don't mind, can we give them the can we give them the microphone? That'd be great. Thanks. Um, we have a son in the family that's a heavy smoker, mm -hmm. and he takes a lot of medication. And I wondered if that affects the benefits of the medication. A pack a day he smoke. What, if you don't mind me asking, what kind of medicine does he take? Uh, for mental, like for schizophrenia. Yeah. So um, I don't want to um, you know, get into his per personal health and in, in, in his personal medical profile. What I will say is irrespective of, of the medications, you know, taking the smoking cigarettes is putting him at significant risk for heart disease, significant risk for lung cancer, significant risk for uh, other, uh, other organ disease. Uh, again, without asking the med knowing the medication, I think we can talk about that offline. In general, whatever medications you're on, you add smoking to it, you're really negating all the positive beneficial effects of those medications. He also has diabetes too. Yeah, so being a diabetic and a smoker, he's at significantly higher risk for heart-related events. Well, 
Um, he should certainly be talking to his primary doctor regularly. I assume he has a primary doctor. And uh, you know, he should be getting good primary preventative counseling. Doctor, what do you think of the keto diet or the keto uh, way of eating? Yeah, so I think any diet that, that focuses on high protein and focuses on low carbohydrate in conjunction with the other healthy um, modification measures like uh, uh, exercise uh, is favorable. But I think it should be done uh, in, a, uh, in a moderated pace. We always tell patients to be careful not to lose too much weight too quickly uh, because that obviously has its own adverse side effects. But I think if that diet, which I believe is what we're referring to, is high in protein and low in carbohydrates, uh, it, it, it can have a favorable effect. Thank you. Keto is low in carbohydrates, <coughs> medium protein, mm -hmm. high fat. Yeah. Good fat, though. Good fat. So you're, so you're talking like the South Beach diet? Is that what, what you're referring to? No. Yeah. So I think... I think um, Atkins diet, okay. So I think that having um, low carbohydrates is always favorable. I think uh, maximizing as much protein is, is always good, but I think especially in someone that has underlying high cholesterol, I, I would be careful in advocating a high-fat diet. Certainly I understand biochemically where they're coming from in terms of maximizing your uh, metabolic activity uh, and maximizing your ability to burn off uh, calories, but I would recommend that that always be done in moderation. My pleasure. Um, so my question is actually more so for someone who has had maybe the LGA, the global amnesia. Would you recommend taking um, aspirin for them, even though they haven't had the heart attack? Or so you mean like a mini stroke? Is that what yes. you mean by that? So I think that should be done in conjunction with your neurologist that's seen you. Typically, when you when somebody's had that event. They undergo a complete scan of the neck arteries and then the uh, brain arteries and the, and the intracranial circulation. I think if it's truly a mini stroke, I think neurologists would tell you that people that have mini strokes are at risk for recurrent mini strokes and even larger strokes. So I think cholesterol medicine to, to lower their cholesterol is critically important. Blood pressure, and usually our neurologists would recommend being on you know, one antiplatelet drug like aspirin. Thank you. My pleasure. Do you have a, uh, an opinion on high intensity interval training versus a steady state exercise? Yeah, so I think it should always be done um, regularly. So I think it's just like anything else that we do. It's kind of like binging versus more regular ways of doing things. I think high intensity exercise, which is done uh, you know, a couple times a week, but it's done regularly is, is important. But I also think that there is invaluable benefit just to doing regular 30 to 45 minutes a day of just doing exercise on, on the treadmill. But I would recommend that the exercise be done regularly because as, as I showed you, the, uh, the benefit to you know, not only really losing weight but maintaining that weight loss is with maintaining that exercise pace. Yes, ma'am. cholesterol was a smidge high over the, the numbers that you want. But my HDL, the good cholesterol, was so high that I really don't need to worry about right. the, the other. And that just, it, it sounds good. I'll go with it. But then again, if your cholesterol is a little high, shouldn't you be concerned? Right. So th there, are, th there are patients like you that have a high HDL. So for those of you who may ask what high HDL is, it's one of the cholesterol particles that's a scavenger that actually eats up the bad cholesterol, and it's considered as a cardioprotective factor. Some people will even say that it's a marker of longevity. So, you know, because exercise can help raise it, uh, you, know, you know, moderate amounts of alcohol can do that. Certain cholesterol medicines can do it. And obviously, you're not on cholesterol medicine, but also there's a genetic component to it. What I will tell you is that you know, usually with an HDL over 60 in women uh, or, or 50 in men, that is a cardioprotective factor. Uh, and it appears in your situation, your, your, your physician believes that you have enough of a, of a protective benefit from that that you don't need to be on a stat. We can talk about the individual numbers offline, but there is a significant benefit towards having high HDL. So HDL uh, is, uh, is your good cholesterol. You want that to be typically over 50, to, over 50 or usually over 60 in women and over 50 in men. 
low HDL actually in patients that we take care of that have um, had a heart event, one of the first things that we'll notice is when we check their HDL, they have low HDL. And, and those are patients that are actually at a higher risk for heart disease than even those that have high LDL. So usually we recommend that if you're diabetic or if you have some cardiovascular disease risk equivalent or if you've even had a, a, a heart event, your LDL be less than 70, even as low as possible. Those PCSK9 inhibitor drugs can bring your LDL down to the 30s or 40s without any adverse, other cog adverse side effects. But usually we'd like your LDL to be less than 100. Yeah, I think it has to be tailored to each individual patient, um, but I think you know, below 100 is considered favorable. So, um, yeah, so red wine. So things that are very, so things that are, so alcohol, one of the adverse side effects is it has carbohydrates. Barley's got carbohydrates. So heavy liquor is obviously not favorable. I think, I think moderate beer is okay. Um, uh, usually red wine, um, you know, red wine is the most favorable kind of alcohol. If you want to have that with your evening meal or have it as an evening drink before going to sleep. Um, you know, one drink a day for women, one to two drinks a day in men. Doctor, what about is if somebody have a um, like a heart attack, but uh, no, no, really. But uh, the doctor say they have uh, they find uh, troponin or troponin. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, there are certain, pa so one of the things that happens when you go to the hospital and you have a heart event or you're having an event which is concerning for being heart related is that the emergency room will check a blood test called troponin. Troponin is an enzyme or a protein that can be made by a, a lot of organs in the body, muscle, brain, and elsewhere, but for a patient with an event that's either heart related or concerning enough to be heart related, checking a troponin is one of the one, ch checking a troponin level is, is done. If somebody has a true heart event, they, had a, they require a stent, you know, that heart muscle has been under stress for some period of time, so those troponin numbers go up. There are certain patients, however, that they come in with an event concerning for the heart, they get some definitive test, either a, an angiogram, a CT scan, sometimes a stress test, which comes back showing that there was not a heart-related heart event, but their troponins could be mildly elevated. Um, we can talk about this a, a little bit offline, but, the, but the, there are, are several reasons why a troponin can be elevated and it's not always related to the heart. You know, there's something called stress cardiomyopathy, uh, what's called Takasubo cardiomyopathy, typically in, uh, in middle age to older women that have been under significant amount of stress. Um, and then they have no blockages or minimal blockages and the heart is under stress and when they look at it under angiogram, it looks like an octopus catcher. Tak takosubo is the Japanese word for octopus catcher. There are those people that just may have spasm of the heart arteries. There are people uh, that may be coming in and may just have some other form of uh, illness. Pulmonary embolism or blood clot to a lung can put stress on the heart and cause troponin elevation. Uh, there, are, there are a number of causes. But that's, you know, if the heart has been ruled out, there's some demand on the heart that's caused a that troponin to go up and then a, a thorough investigation is required and then working with your cardiologist to figure out what that cause was, how it can be treated, and what can be done to mitigate that risk. My pleasure. Yes. We have a question from the online um, people. I have a... I have a woman who is 37 years old with a family of heart disease. Her mom has CHF. She is slightly underweight, has low bad cholesterol and high good cholesterol, and has been, a has been on a vegetarian diet since January. However, um, at her last physical, she had high sensitive C reactive protein. Um, she wants to know if she should be concerned she has a lot of stress, and she doesn't exercise much. Her, um, she has, her blood pressure has been elevated on and off for the past few years, and her doctor is not recommending any medication at this time, and she really wants to treat it uh, naturally. Right. So she's clearly young, and we're very sensitive to the fact that we don't want to obligate someone to being on medications at a young age potentially for you know, several years or decades into their life. So clearly I think the ap approach of taking a preventative 
um, approach towards uh, healthy lifestyle factors is critically important. Now, as I talked about, there are risk factors and then there are risk enhancing factors. Uh, elevated CRP is one of those risk enhancing factors. I would recommend that somebody who's 37, uh, who's um, has, uh, you know, has a predisposition to heart disease because of family history, uh, perhaps some change, you know, perhaps some elevation in their weight, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, they get their cholesterol checked regularly, uh, and then they really focus on all the diet and lifestyle prevent uh, prevention measures. If despite three, six, 12 months of aggressive lifestyle modification measures, we're not able to bring those numbers to goal, then I think, you know, a, a consideration should be given uh, to whether that person will be appropriate for medications, but I think the approach that this person's physician's undertaken is certainly appropriate, but there should be timelines and metrics to make sure that the goals are met. Yes? How dangerous is hyperextensive cardiomyopathy? I have a chicken and a car wall. And my cardiologist says that this thing shows that if it gets thicker, it can block off the valve. That's advice yeah. for me. But how dangerous is, is that condition? Right. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or, or HCM or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy is typically a condition where the uh, wall of the heart, so, uh, so if we think about the left ventricle, the main chamber, there's two walls. There's a, there's this, there's a septum which connects the left ventricle to the right ventricle, and then there's the back wall of the heart. Typically the septum becomes thick. So usually you know, a dimension of less than 1.1 centimeters or 11 millimeters is considered normal. Above that, uh, if it's involving both the front and the back wall, you think about causes like high blood pressure as being the cause. But hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is when the septal wall is thick. And, and there's, it can be you know, more than two centimeters. Yes, there is a concern that you know, that can you know, block off blood flow coming out. It can cause obstruction um, on, on, the, on the mitral valve and on the aortic valve. Uh, it's a condition which has a, gene which has a genetic predisposition. Some people may have it in their family, others may not. Um, but I think it's one of those things that certainly if you've been diagnosed with it, uh, you know, your, your cardiologist uh, should look at um, you know, what are the high risk factors for uh, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There's been data coming out looking at people that have a family history of uh, cardiac arrest. If somebody themselves gets low blood pressure if they've, or if they've had an event on a, with exercise, um, if there are, uh, and again, we can go through this in, in detail, but there's a number of high risk criteria, about five or six of them, that if, that if one has these, the consideration should be given to what's called a, def, uh, a defibrillator or, or an, a, we're an AICD, right, to prevent you from, from having a heart event. Now, with regards to the indications for actually tr doing some sort of a, a, a therapy for that, either open heart surgery where they literally do what's called a myomectomy or shaving of the muscle or uh, catheter-based procedures, where we sometimes where we inject uh, alcohol into those arteries to make the muscles shrink. There are indications for that, but what I would say is if you've not had any of those events, if you have not developed congestive heart failure, if you have not developed significant heart valve issues, if your blood pressure is well controlled and you're being followed closely, I think you're on the right path. My pleasure. Could you talk a little bit about atrial fibrillation and where that fits in in this right. whole conversation? Right. So atrial fibrillation is a great question. It's a condition um, in which the heart uh, heartbeat or the heart's electrical activity is irregular. Um, and it's a condition that the vast majority of the times it's idiopathic, meaning that, we, that, that, the, that the secondary or reversible causes of it are ruled out. So secondary causes, you think about lung disease, you think about... Um, rheumatic heart disease, you think about you know, whether there may be some, a, God forbid, a tumor in the heart, thyroid disease, infections. People if in the hospital and they're, in, they're severely ill, they're, they're septic and they have infection, they can develop atrial fibrillation. Alcohol can do it. But once you've ruled all of that out, then you're really looking at the vast majority of patients that have it because of erratic electrical activity originating usually from the left side of the heart where the four pulmonary veins drain into the, uh, into the left atrium. Atrial fibrillation by itself is not a fatal event, mean, meaning that you know, having a, you know, a fast heartbeat, or sometimes even if it goes a little bit slow, you know, it, may make you feel, it may make you symptomatic. You may feel it, but by itself, it does not kill patients. But what the condition that we most worry about with atrial fibrillation is the risk for stroke. And the reason why that is is because when the heart is fibrillating rather than squeezing effectively, blood, blood can pool into a little pocket called the appendage, the size of an earlobe on the back wall of the heart, and clots can form. 
your risk for a clot formation and as a result stroke because of that is really mitigated based on a number of factors and we look at what's called a CHADS score which is you know a mnemonic for congestive heart failure sorry CHADS VASC score congestive heart failure hypertension age more than 65 or uh, age, between, age between 65 and 74, more than 75, diabetes, previous stroke, vascular disease. Usually if your score is at least one or higher, you, know, you should be on a blood thinner. So for a long time we used to prescribe warfarin or Coumadin, which as you know you have to require frequent blood draws for INRs, dietary modifications. But now we have a number of newer drugs that are available that don't require that. So Perdaxa, Xarelto, Eliquis, and now this newer drug even available called uh, Cervesa or um, Adoxaban. Uh, so, that, so that component of it is critically important and your, your primary cardiologist or electrophysiologist helps manage that. With, regard to, uh, with regards to atrial fibrillation and, heart dis and, and cardiovascular disease, uh, you know, they, there is some hand-in-hand um, -hand component to it where uh, you know, uncontrolled high blood pressure, uncontrolled risk factors for heart disease can sometimes worsen one's uh, underlying burden of atrial fibrillation and their and the risk for heart-related events. Um, I think you know, certainly if somebody has had a heart-related event and they've had a stent or bypass and they've had atrial fibrillation, the data today would suggest that they should be on an aspirin as well as some uh, blood thinner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also have peripheral arterial disease. Is, is there a connection there at all between AFib and PAD and... Yeah. Um, and can you feel palpitations in any other place other than your heart area? Yeah. Like, so, can I feel them in my leg on the left side? Yeah, so peripheral arterial disease is like heart disease of the peripheral arteries. It's, 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 it's a narrowing and, and, and a hardening of those vessels. So there's not really a true one-to-one -one correlation between that. Mm -hmm. I think peripheral arterial disease, we, you know, we focus on uh, you know, reversible things, you know, preventing smoking, you know, you know, you know treating diabetes, treating blood pressure, um, and so that's there. Um, and obviously AFib is, is its own separate entity that like we talked about, and that should be treated. With regards to where you may feel the irregular heartbeats, I think every person has a different way of, you know, where they can typically sense it. Um, I, I can't tell you, no, absolutely not, you can't feel it in certain parts of your body, but most often times people will tell you they can hear it in their ears when they're sleeping and they can wake up with it, they can he feel it in their throat if they're going fast, they can feel it in their chest. There's a variety of places that one can notice the irregular or the erratic nature of their heartbeat. Sure. Uh, you, you have explained to us about the, the, uh, the LDL and HDL, but I did not um, see in your presentation about triglyceride, right. which uh, when I have my blood work, it's always in there. Yep. So triglycerides is the other component. So there's actually four components. There's LDL, HDL, triglycerides, and then VLDL, which is very low LDL, which is your triglycerides divided by five. Your triglycerides is, is a dietary component of your cholesterol. So um, it's a carbon with a lot of glycerol backbone, so we think about what we eat. So, if someone, so that's why we typically say check your cholesterol fasting because if you've had a meal and you've had something to eat that's been rich, your triglycerides are going to be elevated. Now, if in a fasting state your triglycerides are elevated, you think about a genetic kind of you know, a hypercholesterolemia or we sometimes we think about whether there may be underlying diabetes. Elevated blood sugars, uh, glucose, because, you know, because it's the same chemical, uh, similar chemical compound. If your LDL, your HDL are well controlled, but you have a high triglyceride, you should you know, make sure you're not diabetic. Thank you. But there are drugs for primary hypertriglyceridemia that treat just that if, you, if everything else has been ruled out uh, and, and then treated appropriately. So drugs like Tricor, phenofibrate, and, then, and even statins, they can lower triglycerides to, com to some level, although not as good as they lower LDL. Yes? Thank you. In 2011, I had an acute stroke. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, it was, I was 70 years old when that happened. And they gave me the enzyme to clear the clot. TPA? Yes, and it did clear the clot. Mm -hmm. Why does, don't they give this after anybody after 75 years of age? Is it because of the risk? Yeah, so TPA is a, is, a, is, a clot, is a clot buster, and so we have mechanisms internally to break up clot, but this drug is typically available. There are certain indications for it, and if you come within a certain time frame, 
of, of, of having a stroke-like symptoms, you know, that's certainly an indication. Uh, but there's other, you know, uh, risk fact, there are other things that may be contraindications. So above a certain age, uncontrolled high blood pressure. If you're on other blood thinners, because, you know, then you're going to be really at high risk for bleeding. But I think it's, you know, those things like that, things that really put you at a higher risk for bleeding. So uh, age, um, because, you know, over time, our, our, uh, the blood vessels in our brain become more fragile, so there's a higher risk for bleeding. Um, uh, but you know, there are a number of things that we look at in terms of contraindications to being on it. But over the age of 75, there's some hesitancy in terms of giving that because of the risk. So how would you clear the clot? If you, if you can't take the PEA, yeah. how would you clear the clot? So we have a number of mechanisms that we can do it. If you're within the time period that, that you're felt to be appropriate, uh, you know, we have ways with interventional radiology uh, where they can literally go through your leg up into the circulature of, their, of your brain and extract the clot. That, that's one way that can be done. If somebody is felt to be outside the time window to benefit from that, then certainly medications are available as well. Um, but, you know, I think if you've had an event and, you know, it sounds like, thank God, you've been treated very well over the last eight years with good medications, uh, my, my hope would be that your chances for a subsequent event will be significantly less. My pleasure. Okay, um, during a non-heart related operation, I developed a left bundle branch block, mm -hmm. which they say is not bothering me. If it does bother me in the future, I'd have to have a pacemaker. Is there a way to reverse that to make it better, right. come back? <laughs> right, so a bundle branch, so when we think of the heart, we think of uh, the heart like being, the structure that we're standing in. It's got a plumbing circuit where blood is, so where, um, where water is flowing, and then we have an electrical circuit, which is what keeps the lights on. The heart's electrical circuits from its underlying pacemaker, the underlying pacemaker. And as the electrical signals travel down the heart, on the right side and the left side, they travel down bundle branches. Uh, there's a right bundle branch, and then there's a left bundle branch. Uh, essentially, a block in one of those bundle branches means that the ability for electrical activity to travel down, down those branches is slowed down. Usually a right bundle branch block is benign. It's, there's a, no adverse consequence. If a left bundle branch block happens, it can be, you know, from a variety of things. The thing you obviously want to make sure it's not due to is due to a narrowing in a heart artery or blockage. You want to make sure it's not due to just slowing down of the electrical circuit in which the heart requires a pacemaker. Uh, and sometimes it can be just due to, you know, electrical rate related mechanisms and phenomenon. If it's happened to you, you know, I'm sure your cardiologist that follows you has probably gotten a monitor or they followed you as an outpatient where they follow your heart rate. But if you've ruled out, uh, you know, underlying heart disease, underlying heart failure, you've ruled out other underlying organic pathologies and there's no need for a pacemaker, I think clinical observation is appropriate. For an individual. <laughs> oh, <there it> is. <laughs> okay. For an individual diagnosed with SVT, yes. is that also considered an erratic electrical activity in the heart? Right. And what is the cure for SVT? Right. So sup SVT or supraventricular tachycardia uh, is a fast, uh, irregular heartbeat that typically happens from some area mm -hmm. above, supra above the ventricles. So the heart is, is a compact structure, four compartments, two top atria, two bottom ventricles, but there's some area above the ventricles where it happens. Uh, and it can happen from a, a variety of different causes where there's electrical circuits propagating. Atrial fibrillation is one kind of SVT, but the more common ones that you're probably referring to are atrial flutter. There's conditions called AVNRT, and they usually come on very quickly. You can feel it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we tell people to bear down, cough, mm -hmm. Uh, do mechanisms to break it. Uh, it's an extreme irregular... Extreme palpitations. Yes, yeah, extreme palpitations. It's usually benign. They're usually self-limiting. They, 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 they terminate very quickly. Sometimes it requires, you know, giving an IV medicine in the emergency room to do that. But depending on the kind of SVT you may have, like atrial flutter or AVNRT, the treatment may just be, ob you know, observing you versus having, you know, taking a medicine as needed versus doing something called an ablation where we go with catheters through the leg up into the heart to you know, burn the electrical circuit. I would strongly encourage you to talk to an electrophysiologist. They're much smarter than I am, and they'll be able to explain to you how these processes work. 
but you know, the patients that I see that have that, uh, I like to see what exactly it was, what kind of SVT, and I then usually refer them to a electrophysiologist, a, um, a heart rhythm cardiologist that deals with those. Okay, and then the ablation is not always necessary, in other words. Yeah, it depends on the patient. So, you know, if, if, it's, if it's a one-time event, it has not happened, it has not caused significant amount of symptoms, I think a lot of electrophysiologists would recommend observing you. But if it happens again and they understand where it's coming from and it's a pathway that can be uh, accessed through the approach where they go through the groin and they know it's curative and it won't happen again, then, uh, then an ablation is, a, um, uh, is not an unreasonable approach. Okay, and one more question related to that. The pulse rate, how does that tie in to the supraventricular tachycardia? So certainly when the heart's beating fast, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, whether it's, you know, if it's from some irregular er erratic activity originating from the top chamber of the heart, it, w it will manifest itself with the bottom chamber picking up the speed and going faster. And then your body will sense that either in your pulse, in your neck arteries, in your chest, or elsewhere. You may feel lightheaded. You may feel like you're a little bit woozy. Mm -hmm. Patients have different uh, sensations and responses. Diabetics may not notice things as well because of, uh, because of underlying nerve disease. So uh, there's a variety of which, uh, ways in which we can sense that. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Here's a question. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, my uh, blood pressure is usually uh, is often uh, in the 90s. Uh, the last time I took it yesterday was 90 over 58. Before it was 98 over 56. Uh, how? Imp what significance is there in that? For example. Are you on blood pressure medications? Uh, yeah, I take Xarelto 20 milligrams. So, uh, so Xarelto for AFib as a blood thinner. But are oh, you on blood right. pressure medications? Um, I take so many. I take over twenty medications a day. Right. So, so you know, a blood pressure. Know. Yeah, a blood pressure of ninety by itself is not considered um, <clears throat> of of danger to you if you don't have any symptoms. So, if you're walking around with a good blood pressure, I'm sorry, so with a good heart rate, you're not having any symptoms. You're not lightheaded. I mean, we're essentially looking at the ability of the end organs of the body to, to you know to, to you know to get blood flow. If you're getting good blood flow, you're not lightheaded, you have good circulation, and you're not having any symptoms, uh, and you're on medications, then I think your doctor will follow you closely. If on the other hand, you, you know, you're very sensitive to it, you have, you have very high, you, you have very heightened, uh, heightened awareness to all of this, and the blood pressure circulates, I would say fluctuates, and you don't respond to it well, then your cardiologist may need to lower that. I mean, may need to lower your blood pressure medicine to help raise your blood pressure. I've had uh, over, uh, officially over uh, three uh, uh, pulmonary emboli. Uh, they, they came, uh, those three came uh, out of uh, knee surgery and uh, hip surgery. Uh, I, uh, you know, is there, how is that different from a, a uh, you know, a, a clock that isn't maybe produced by a, a surgeon. Right. So pulmonary embolism is a clot that typically forms usually in the legs. <clears throat> so it's called a venous thromboembolism, somewhere in the, in, in, in the deep veins of the lower extremities, and it migrates up into the right side of the heart into the lungs. And it can happen, um, you know, if you've been uh, sedentary for a long time, you haven't been moving around like you were in a, in, in a car for a long time, in a long uh, drive. In an airplane, we haven't been moving around, or if you've been sick in the hospital and you've been laying flat, or if you're in the hospital, you have some inflammatory condition, you've been bed bound. It can happen if you have a hypercoagulable state, meaning you have, a, you have a, again, there's a number of, a number of these in which the body has a predisposition to forming clot and not breaking it down. But that's different from the kind of clot that we see from a stroke, which is, happens on the arterial circuit, from the carotid arteries, or the kind of clot that happens in the heart arteries uh, when typically, uh, you know, plaque ruptures and those clots kind of go in there and then they close off the circulation. Pulmonary embolism is a really on a separate path that happens because of a clot formation in, in the venous circuit on the right side of the body that goes up to the heart and the lungs. I had, in 2000, uh, I have left main anterior, uh, you know, replacement with my uh, mm -hmm. memory. And, uh, and then since, well, I've had many surgeries since then um, on my spine primarily, but uh, I just wonder, uh, I've heard lots of things about life expectancy uh, 
So uh, this has been over 19 years. Uh, what is the usual time frame of uh, being so, realistic and yeah. you know just just common sense? Yeah. So bypass surgery um, is, uh, as many of you know, is, is where with literally open heart surgery, they sew uh, uh, some sort of, of a conduit or a channel past the, by, past the area of bypass onto the native arteries. Typically, the, the most common is the mammary artery, what's called the lima, left internal mammary on the left side. And they bypass that usually onto your left anterior descending artery. And then sometimes they can use even your radial artery as a high harvest or your right mammary, but most oftentimes a couple of veins in the legs. Uh, left internal mammaries, the, the data suggests that they will usually stay open for, you know, for the remainder of your life. Veins, on the <laughs> other hand, are about 10 years, they have about a 50% rate where they can close. But when that happens, the heart has an internal mechanism of forming bypasses where uh, internal bypasses happen from one side of the heart to the other if those veins close. Now, if you have symptoms and they come on, we have ways in which we can open up the native arteries, again, with balloons and stents. But usually if you don't have symptoms and you're doing well, you have good heart function, no signs of congestive heart failure, no signs of valvular heart disease, then medical therapy is the way to go. And we know that mammary arteries usually stay open for the rest of your life. Uh, well, okay, I can ask a few more, but that's fine. Thank you. Dr. Tarani, we yeah. have two more questions from our virtual sure. audience. Um, I have a gentleman who is interested on, in your opinion on the benefit of checking or not checking the C-reactive protein at an annual exam. And then the other question is, can PAC be detected during an E? Wait, can PAC detect it during an EKG be dangerous? Yeah, so you know, the, uh, as, as I mentioned, an elevated CRP is a, uh, is a marker of inflammation and can be a risk-enhancing risk factor. I think what I would recommend is if your CRP is elevated, to look for a reason why it is. Make sure there's nothing else in the body that can make your CRP go up. There's no infection, mm -hmm. there's no inflammatory condition that's going on. If that's been all ruled out, and this person has, you know, uh, has cardiovascular risk factors, then they need to be you know, assessed and evaluated. Diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, and then the, and then the, the uh, uh, determination should be made based on where they fall in the risk spectrum, whether a coronary calcium score is needed, and then the intensity of therapy with uh, you know, um, cholesterol medication as appropriate. With regard to a PAC or a premature atrial contraction, which is a skip beat originating from the top chamber of the heart, that's noted on an EKG. If you have no symptoms and it's an incidental finding, it has no adverse consequence. If you put a monitor on, on a patient over 24 hours and you follow their heart rate activity, you can have hundreds or thousands of PACs and they have no adverse consequences if you have no symptoms. Usually we try to find out why you may have it. Uh, could it be... Uh, could it be something in your diet? Could it be just be sleep? Uh, you know, things like that. But usually without any adverse consequence, I'm sorry, without any underlying heart, is heart organic issues and good heart function, a PAC is as incidental as, uh, as anything else in our life. It, some people can feel PAC. Some people can tell you, I, I feel skip beats when they come on. No, you just feel it. And sometimes, you know, uh, you know, frequent enough PACs can trigger some sort of SVT. Uh, you know, they can trigger atrial arrhythmias or whatnot. But usually, just an incidental finding on an EKG is as incidental as it, as it can be. Yes? I think the question about the CRP was whether or not it should be part of a routine annual. Yeah, so I think, you know, I think anything that's being done uh, annually should be done to answer a question. So I think, I, 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 yeah, I, so I think if, if, you've, um, if you have determine that there's some underlying condition that may predispose you to having an increased inflammatory state, I will treat that. And if that's treated appropriately and it's, and it's, and it's all within uh, the target of the guidelines, I think my focus will be on that uh, rather than using the CRP individually annually. Yes, sir. Explain what an ablation does exactly. I, I know you said it, it tried to monitor the electrical process. Mark Wish is head of the program. Mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, is that 
What does an ablation do? If you've had the kind of history I've had. What did you have an ablation of? What 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 did they ablate? Uh, I, it was my left. My problem is left wing, left side of my wing. Yeah. So usually an, an ablation is for a heart rhythm problem. So if it's for atrial fibrillation, where they sometimes can. Uh, offer some radio frequency energy or even use, uh, use what's called cryo balloons or cold balloons to isolate the electrical circuits in the pulmonary veins. That's typically what an, an, an ablation is. Depending on the condition that the ablation is being used for, you know, the, uh, uh, the success rates can vary. So for something like atrial flutter or some other, other kind of AVNRT, uh, other SVD like AVNRT, success rates are over 90, 95%. For atrial fibrillation, and again, I will always defer to my colleagues, but they usually say that around five years, uh, the success rates for atrial fibrillation and ablation are over 80%. Some patients may require a, a second ablation. But um, atrial fibrillation by itself uh, is a heart rhythm issue, whereas heart disease, as we're talking about today, is, is an issue related to uh, hardening of the arteries due to these risk factors that we talked about. Yes, ma'am. Well, the reason why he has a defibrillator is because he has a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so the concern is that he may have some sort of a, you know, he was deemed to be a higher risk, I assume, for, you know, for having a heart-related event or heart arrhythmia or, or, or maybe already had an event. And so uh, the, the AICD was there to help abort that fatal heart rhythm should it happen by shocking him out of it. So it's there purely uh, for that rhythm. Now, sometimes can somebody can... Somebody may develop a fatal heart rhythm because of a critical blockage in a heart artery um, in which somebody can develop either chest pain with EKD changes uh, that bring them to the hospital, or they may have a fatal heart rhythm where they literally uh, lose consciousness. In that situation, the AICD would kick in for that as well. But the AICD is for purely a uh, fatal electrical heart rhythms like ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. I think we're out of time. Um, I really appreciate you giving me some of your time this evening. I hope we were able to answer some of your questions. Thank you.